Dear ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Bellevue Asset Management, I would like to welcome you to our update call on BB Biotech today, June 3rd, 2020. My name is Patrick Fishley. I will be your host today. Our last call on BB Biotech took place end of March. A lot has happened since then. As we pointed out at the time, the share price of BB Biotech has not only stabilized, but it has recovered by more than 60% since the low of March 15th and is now year to day up by 10%. Many investors are currently focusing on the development of trucks against Corona. This may seem exciting, but is not sustainable. In our opinion, only commercial successful ther uh, therapeutics approaches promise attractive long-term returns. For example, we do not have Moderna in our portfolio because of its potential corona drug, which by the way, did not produce the top result yet, but because of its attractive technology platform, which is an excellently suited for longer term drug development. I'm now pleased to give the floor to Dr. Daniel Koller, who can give you even a better insight into the current development and the portfolio of BB Biotech. Daniel, please. Thanks for the introduction and a warm welcome as well from my side and the whole BB Biotech team uh, to today's or June 3rd uh, to this WebEx call. Um, we have the forward-looking statements that we do here um, and you see on slide three already a quick rundown of the topics. The first one I will go rather quickly because it's just facts and figures around BB Biotech itself as well as a couple of comments around the industry and the dynamism or the dynamics that we have there, but then spend most of the time actually on uh, three and four and five, where I gonna present about how do we invest into innovation? Um, how does the current investment strategy look like in this environment? And as well, uh, try to give you an outlook, how do we see asset future um, for our investments and the industry as such? Um, to the company or the investment company BB Biotech um, on slide five, as you are well aware, uh, we have a very long track record in existence since November 1993. I just would love to highlight the fact that I said we are in a couple of the important um, Swiss benchmarks, the broad benchmarks, actually the SMIM, so the mid-sized or top 50 as we call it out here. And then I said recently or uh, towards uh, the second part of 2019 actually got the inclusion as well into the SPI Select Dividend Index <clears throat> because BB Biotech, as you know, and as we just close on the right hand side as well with uh, a couple of figures and numbers um, that we pay a dividend uh, of or dividend yield of around 5%. Um, with that already to page six, where you see our um, board of directors. There we had actually a news to announce uh, because we had two new additions that you see on the right hand side. Susan Galbright, which is very well known um, in the English speaking part or in the UK, given that she runs or is lead of uh, AstraZeneca's uh, R&D efforts in, in uh, oncology. And then to the very right hand side, you see uh, Mats Thompson, He's the CSO of Nova Nordisk for many years and um, uh, obviously highly has a great reputation for what Nova is doing on the endocrine and metabolics uh, front and an absolute leader in, in, in the field as such. So we're very proud to have these two. So BB Biotech has reached now with five um, uh, board members actually the goal that we want to have and that we want to continue to go forward with. Then on the team side on page seven, um, Still the same pictures, which I think is good news. So uh, the team is together for a long time. Um, you see on uh, the first six there from the top are actually uh, the team that represents the portfolio management side. And then Celia Schantz, Marie Graz Alderucho and Claude Mikkels invest relation uh, that we have uh, for the different geographies. Um, I said here, the good news, working together for a long time. What we are currently contemplating is that we uh, are rather considering to hire someone to broaden the team because we want to prepare uh, how BB Biotech will go into the three and five and 10 year future uh, that we are well prepared as well uh, for the next challenge as well as the opportunities that we think are clearly out there. Then towards uh, 
more back to the short-term performance and the short-term uh, swings that we had. As uh, Patrick introduced, uh, we had the sell-off in March and since then actually quite a steep recovery. And now have uh, could turn actually from, I said, quite a steep um, correction uh, till mid late March into double-digit positive territory that you see here. We have depicted as well uh, the Swiss broad benchmark, the SPI, uh, that's still in negative territory, but still holding up quite well in a European context. With I said, most European equity benchmarks still minus 10 to rather minus 20. And I said the SPI has held up better because it has a high weighting in big pharma. But you see as well that I said BB Biotech there with I said a double digit positive gain uh, clearly could separate itself. And on the right hand side, without going into the details, you see a couple of the reasons that were the trigger for the sell off. And then starting mostly in April as well, um, that I said infections rates started to peak, the lockdown measures started to be. Um, unraveled at least in select European countries and then most importantly we had a lot of monetary and fiscal interventions that have as I said led or actually been probably the main reason for the rebound and for us the good news is said we had a lot of good fundamental news in the meantime which I will present in a couple of slides from now on. How does this look uh, last year in terms of performance? Last year was a good equity year, 2019, we've said mid-20s performance. We have there been pretty much bang in line with the benchmark and then you see on a 10 year horizon, so longer term already or since inception, a really long term track record that we have achieved quite positive and solid, both absolute as well as relative performance. And how this all accumulates is what you see on slide 10, actually long-term performance on a linear scale. A, I want to highlight that we are close now to our longer-term goals that we still state as well on four base, that we want to achieve a 15% return on investment. And B, you see here as well how I said uh, delta performance or actually a relative positive performance that we could achieve on accumulated basis in the mid and long term generates very substantial outperformance, for example, against a passive or average investment, as we call it here, the Nasdaq Biotech Index depicted in the light reddish uh, color as such. Just a few words to the industry. I don't want to spend too much time on this. Um, R&D productivity. You know, there are a lot of clinical trials and a lot of clinical assets ongoing, actually record numbers. But an easy measure is always how many products actually make it through the regulatory authority hurdles. And that's the FDA in that depiction here on the bullet number one. So last year was a good year with 48 approvals. On a year to date basis till the end of May, we are already north of 20 um, achieved approvals. Even in a pandemic environment and lockdown situation, as said, uh, regulatory authorities work, even though they're under new leadership. And then bullet number two is a reflection of this. As said, the more products approved and the broader they're launched on a global scale, you see here the growth in terms of absolute revenue numbers on an annual basis. So we think we are soon to hit the 200 billion revenues on a global scale. And I said on a forward basis, well, to sustain and maintain the high single digit to around 10% um, compounded revenue growth rate for the foreseeable future. And last but not least, M&A, that's on a micro level in terms of industry activity. Last year was a very good year in terms of, I said, um, a very high deal numbers um, that you see there, but less deals. Um, so we had a clear acceleration in absolute dollars because I said, a few very large deals happened. In 2020, the number is still close to zero, very de minimal, because here the lockdown actually had real impact and we think that will lead to an acceleration of deals again in the second half and then in 2021, when I said the pandemic starts to unravel, people come back and travel again and can meet up, which I think is an important trigger that M&A transactions will be announced and can be consummated as such. Um, and then on a profit level, that's not new as well for whoever uh, follows BU Biotech for the longer time or longer term already. You know, a 50 to 20 year investment cycle for the industry, then profitability in the mid 2000s. And then you see there's still volatility and actually the optic of profitability, but nowadays a substantial expansion again ahead of ourselves. The good news here, and that I would want to highlight, is a set of profitability that has been driven by a few large cap companies that we have seen in the past 
Nowadays, we have more and more actually of the mid-cap companies that reach sustainable profitability. So we think, as I said, the quality of the consensus estimates on a forward basis will actually increase because breadth and depth of, as I said, uh, the companies that are profitable will substantially increase in the next two or three years to come. And one slide, the only slide actually towards, um, as I said, the COVID-19 pandemic um, is slide 14. Um, because I think it highlights or it represents actually the, enorm, the enormous momentum actually that the industry had. And you see here starting in mid-January um, in the top figure there that we had the first initial antiviral and vaccines that started to be tested in Asian countries because the pandemic back then was isolated uh, to this geography. And then you see a massive acceleration starting in February and mostly March and then April with now more than 150 different molecules tested that are, have a direct antiviral activity or are tested for that. More than 200 medicines tested for actually as a treatment, mostly to target uh, the side effects that go along or the response of the body to an infection that you try to dampen down, uh, like for example, the huge inflammations that we often see. And then for at least our portfolio, the only interest there are the vaccines as well. They're a triple digit figure that have now, or that is ongoing. You see at the bottom part there in this little table that I said the vaccine obviously had to be developed from scratch because you needed to have the COVID 19 spike proteins and specific epitopes. But I said here, I think exemplary how aggressive and quick the industry responded. And we think that's the only solution and actually the best chance for an answer if there is a potential second wave to come, potentially in fall or winter time, we shall see. How do we invest? Um, and the investment process on slide 16, that's not new. Um, it's still our main job as a team uh, to break down a broad and complex and fast moving universe from around a thousand companies into ultimately a portfolio of minimum 20 position and maximum 35. And we do so by actually focusing on a couple of key disease areas that you see on slide 17 on the left hand side. So oncology, the cancer indication is clearly uh, one of our hotspots uh, that we do a lot of efforts and due diligence. The orphan diseases where the industry has um, started off a lot. Central nervous system is now a multi-year effort for ours and then cardiovascular metabolic syndrome as well. That's an area, unfortunately, often covered by big pharma, but we see nowadays more and more small mid-cap biotechs um, actually who start to develop drugs in that space. And I will mention one of the three examples uh, that I can highlight uh, more for you in the coming slides being from that space. And then we have different modalities. That's the other side, how we dissect the industry. Uh, that's more described on the right hand side on that slide. So the classical one was the new chemical entities or the small molecules. Then we have the biologics and antibodies and RNA based therapies that you don't take daily, but often then weekly or monthly or sometimes only quarterly. And then the latest addition to the armamentarium, the cell based therapies, gene therapies and gene editing. I said there the goal is to go to once a year or ideally even uh, to curative therapies that you take once in a lifetime. These are still for um, smaller indication and often come with a much higher price tag as such, but we think that's another angle or dimension and matrix uh, that we want to look at. And you see on slide 19 actually the real time or the historic depiction of when did you invest into these different modalities starting off as the industry with small molecule antibodies and proteins, and then expanded that over the last 10 and 50 years quite substantially, starting off with peptides to complex antibodies to target toxin deliveries, which we have now as well, a new addition in the portfolio, all the way to messenger RNA and gene editing, which were the latest addition. And you see on the right-hand side, I would love to highlight now our walk through three of these newer additions that we did two to three years ago. Um, two of them in the more classical field of the small molecules and antibody world. And then Moderna, which I would like to kick off because I said Moderna has gotten or was quite a bit in the limelight recently or in the spotlight given, I said, the COVID-19 vaccine approach that they started off. Uh, but you see 
already depicted there on the right hand side in the chart below. And it looks like there is a missing line there because we started to invest into the company in January 18, but back then the company was private, did an IPO late in 2018 and had quite a struggle at the beginning because said it came with quite a valuation to the market and a lot of investors didn't understand, we think at least the technology and the power of it. And I said the company got a lot of attention given I said the COVID-19 vaccine candidate that's now already in mid-stage clinical development and soon to be in late stage. Um, I said for us it was an attractive investment case because Moderna is the leader or the leading company in the messenger RNA technology field and we think it allows the so-called gain of function strategy that the company has deployed in a very broad pipeline. So had already multiple vaccine projects ongoing for CMV, RSV, HBM and, and others, as well as starts to build now a pipeline to rare genetic diseases and has brought uh, partnerships into high risk indication like oncology and cardiovascular, or for example, with our other in, uh, portfolio company, Vertex and Cystic Fibrosis, and has over now the IPO and secondaries, uh, a very strong cash coffer of north of 3 billion of cash. So very well positioned to capture future technology value that they can now develop themselves. And obviously reached quite an impressive market capitalization north of 20 billion as well, given I said that there are some expectation clearly built into the COVID-19 vaccine. Why did this happen? And we have clear understanding why I said markets uh, start to project there as well what the company is doing on the vaccine field. You see there, for example, the clinical data we had early, but very promising on the right hand top side for the CMV vaccine. So multiple shots of messenger RNA formulated in lipid nanoparticles generate very positive and high titers um, of actually antibodies in these healthy volunteers to then actually, or as I said, generate neutralizing antibodies that then actually can protect against infections. CMV here is very important because that it's, it's, it has a major impact for newborn babies. If they get the virus already from the mother, um, they can have very detrimental uh, nerve damage as such. Or said, think of all the, pe the people out there with certain immunocompromised situations. So here I said a vaccine that could go into broad population on a repeat basis and would reflect the sustainable long-term business, I think with very high value proposition for Moderna and our ASUS investor. Whereas SARS is now focused on the pandemic, strain the COVID vaccine or the COVID-2. I start strain and see there at the bottom part how quickly and aggressively the company could translate from the genetic information that the company selected in January 13th already start to inject the first healthy volunteer mid-March and can actually in the summer of this year always start large registrational trial with the potential if the regulators um, actually accept, I would say rather phase two data set as approvable or accelerated approval pathway that by Q4 we could potentially already have a vaccine for at-risk population or as I said, the healthcare workers out there to have protection for them. An example more in the classical field of the new chemical entities or small molecules is myocardia. But actually what triggered our investment was that the company focused on cardiovascular disease and very selectively with a precision medicine approach into actually patients that have an underlying genetic mutation or genetic cause of that disease. Um, the product in development is called Mavacampton, has reached or has now actually announced or a company announced just a couple of weeks ago positive phase three for the first indication in obstructive hypercardiomyotrophy hypermyocardiotrophy if you can pronounce it correctly and you see there the jump in valuation given a set that there is nothing approved out there we have multiple 10,000 to 100,000 of patients in the developed world, we think that's going to be a high price medication. The company, as you see there at the bottom part left, is well financed, has a market cap of now around 5 billion. And what has triggered, as said, uh, the valuation jump is actually said a positive data readout for HCM. And what is HCM? That's actually said a hypercontractility of the heart, of the left part of the heart which means the heart squeezes constantly too hard and leads to um, over time an enlargement of the heart 
and that leads to all the secondary uh, follow-on uh, problems that I said. Um, the heart cannot function that well anymore. The blood that's pumped is not oxygen oxygenated that well anymore. So I said patients over time have less and less oxygen in the body. And by that, all the complications, secondary problems. And one very famous or one case that's quite famous are, I said, the elite sport or the sport athletes that you hear about that are 20 or sometimes mid 20s or 30s that suddenly fall dead. Uh, these patients have suffered from that genetic disease, had an enlarged heart that was not detected. And I said they had a sudden uh, cardiac arrest and died. And I said the positive phase three trial that the company reported was the symptom score. Uh, I said the arrow goes down there quite a bit. So you see actually the symptom benefit was clearly there, peak VO2, so the oxygenation of the blood that goes into the body got increased quite a bit. And you see, for example, another indirect measure, the blood pressure actually could be lowered. And that's a positive because if the blood pressure stays high, the only way actually to go around would otherwise be a very invasive surgery we can be avoided. So we think, as I said, the company had here very positive phase three data readout will file this program by the end of this year and have a 2021 launch and will move from now a clinical development stage company actually into commercial stage rather quickly and has full or has the full retained rights for this program. And a similar situation but for a very different indication um, happened for Argenix. Let's start with the chart because it looks uh, quite impressive and has triggered as well quite a good performance for BB Biotech. Um, Orgenics report as well, very positive phase three results, but for completely different indication here, the company focuses on autoimmune disorder, so severe autoimmune disorder. Um, they reported results for myasthenia gravis, meaning patients who have a lot of so-called autoimmune antibodies or antibodies that they have or that they produce that actually attack self and organs as such. And they had a clever way actually with FRTGMOT to actually reduce the amount of these autoimmune or, or autoimmune triggering antibodies. Um, and by that, I said, achieved very impressive clinical results, which I can just show you in a minute. They have, <clears throat> we think, a very interesting pipeline because that product allows actually to develop into multiple different indications, plus have other uh, deals such as with Janssen, with for Cusatuzumab in AML, so in cancer indication, you, as well as, you see as well at the bottom part, they are well financed, uh, said to, or well prepared now to go commercial and have reached now a market cap in uh, the mid cap space or larger mid cap arena. The data set that they announced, you see there on page 25, a clear reduction of symptoms, um, a very fast onset of action. Don't want to go in all of the details of that. And what was very positive for us as well, a clean uh, safety profile. So we think there, as I said, Argenix is on the way actually um, uh, to launch now FCAR TIGI mod in 2021. Firstly in myasthenia gravis, followed then by multiple different indication and has here as well, we think a large uh, business opportunity of ahead of itself. So three uh, of the mid-sized position that have now, we think de-risked quite a bit, are with very strong balance sheets, um, um, actually well capitalized, I said, to go and reach um, a self-sustainable future such. And I think they're perfectly, and that's why I mentioned here on slide 27, they're perfectly here aligned to walk up through our so-called S-curve. So as a reflection, the young startup companies bottom left and the large pharma companies top right. And you see there in a schematic depiction in this S-curve that we invest in this red circle, meaning companies that have proof of concept in clinical settings, we start to invest into. And we follow these companies uh, for the mid and long term, how they move up the S-curve. And as you can see here, Moderna is still at the lower part. We think they have now de-risked a lot. Um, and we could depict here a myocardia and Argenix still below the break even because they have not launched yet products. But in the next two or three years, we think they are on the clear trajectory to get there and to move up the ladder in terms of as well the value creation for us as shareholders. The goal here is, as I said, to achieve a return on investment target of 15%. And to do so with a concentrated portfolio that you see on page 28. And I mention, I can mention here that the top 10 
make up around two thirds of the portfolio. And you see there in the light reddish bars, the three companies we highlighted are Genix, Moderna, and Myocardia. So I don't want to spend more time on them. But you see here the depiction of the portfolio by March 31st. Um, so by the end of Q1, so you can assume as well that I said these companies have now given the share price performance grown in the recent weeks and months in our portfolio, even on a relative basis um, compared to the rest of the portfolio. And what we want to highlight as well are the two new additions that we classically size smaller in our portfolio because they come they know at a high risk as well. So we don't have only to reflect on the opportunity or the return opportunity, but as well on the risk. So see there, Black Diamond and Fate Therapeutics were the two additions we did. In the sell-off, we applied or deployed as well capital into existing smaller mid-cap companies that suffered in the first quarter because of the setback in, in, in the stock market, not from a fundamental perspective. But let me quickly highlight the two new positions. And you see there, I think, a well-described summary of FATE. Why do we think FATE Therapeutics is interesting? We had in the longer past two investments in cell-based therapies. These were Juno and Kite. Both of these companies were acquired a couple of years ago by Gilead and then Celgene. Um, why do we think FATE is interesting? Because FATE has developed a technology that's based on stem cells, meaning how do you use stem cells in the laboratory, you can grow and multiply them in a upscalable manufacturing way that's scalable and sizable. So I think FATE has here all the opportunity actually to generate um, um, a mass manufactured um, tailored product for a lot of cancer patient, a broader indication, whereas the first generation technologies from June and Kite were autologous, meaning they were individual coming from the individual patient that was very costly and time consuming and here we have a technology that would allow us say, to broaden out and uh, said we have to wait and see if it translates into the same efficacy level if so we think it would be a huge win as I said for a lot of cancer patients as well as for fate and us as investors and the second company is black diamond uh, they develop small molecules or so new chemical entities here the goal is actually to target proteins or oncology target that are i would say quite well known the problem as you know in oncology that a lot of these cancer or oncogenes or drivers of cancer mutate away meaning they make the cancer shies away of the therapies has mutations that make them non-sensitive to the existing therapies anymore and we think here as i said black diamond has a unique approach actually to make these mutated proteins approachable again or targetable again with their new chemical entities and we expect uh, important data then in uh, 2021 so that will require some patience but we think as i said they have a unique way actually to generate attractive new molecules as i said to target large indications and how does the portfolio from a top-down level look like you see on page 31 so you see on the left hand side a different indication so three quarter of the portfolio is dominated by orphan oncology and neuro. We think that will stay like this for the foreseeable future. In the middle, you see it's a 100% dollar denominated portfolio because even our European success story with Argenix, uh, we buy this through the ADR listing on the right hand side, you see around 10% of the classical large cap space. And then the heavy weight actually in the bigger mid caps, so five to 30 billion market cap and around 40% of the portfolio invested um, in actually below five billion where we deploy most of the de novo investments, meaning the new capital that we deploy into new investment ideas. Coming to the outlook, um, slide 33. I don't wanna mention here a line by line um, these um, different clinical programs, but let me just highlight, I said, some of these clinical programs that you see there in the middle are Genix 113 or FGAR Tigimod, as it's nowadays as well called. That was the big drive for the step up in evaluation for our Genix or Mavic Hampton, just one line above that in obstructive HCM for myocardi was a major step up. And you see the, we still have a couple of headlines even for the month of June that we expect and then many more so for the second part of 2020. Why are these important? Because these are the precursors or the pre-requirement that we have that what you see on slide 34 actually will turn into approved products. And that's what we need 
as a sustained growth trajectory for our portfolio as well as for these companies and for the industry. And every gray box that you see here is actually check the box for a major regulatory approval. We start a year off with one negative decision, but uh, that's for us important, not the important um, investment hypothesis for Nectar. Um, but then you see Esperon, Insight, Neurocrine, Halazyme with its partner J&J and GenMap, or Neurocrine then with its partner Abvi, or Insight again with its partner Novartis achieved important product approvals. And we still have important product approvals ahead of ourselves. Why is this important? Because this builds the basis what you see on slide 35. And I think that's still one of the core messages we have for our shareholders and investor. BB Biotech is clearly a growth investor. And you see this, um, I think, exemplarily depicted here on slide 35. On the right hand side, the different indication. So from top down, you see neuro-oncology, cardiovascular, women's health and metabolic disorders, etc. be major driver for our current and future growth. And I think a newer depiction for most investors, what you see on the left-hand side, that said with the approved products, so the 2019 and earlier approved products, we achieve already north of 10% top line growth uh, until the mid-20s. And then every single individual launch year, so 2020 is the green part that's stacked up on top, adds quite a lot of absolute and relative growth and so on for every individual year. For example, 2023 looks like an important year for us again, that we have their important revenue growth trajectory to come. And I said, the guidance here that we are clearly north of 20%, that's more than double the industry and much more than, for example, said Big Pharma and many other areas of the healthcare industry, which grow at much more moderate rates uh, than I said, the high growth uh, conviction portfolio that we have here at BB Biotech. And to close it out, two slides. Um, this is about you know portfolio topics as well as external external factors that we think will impact um, uh, BB Biotech and the industry on a forward basis. Whereas the first one being more a reflection on um, how the COVID nineteen pandemic actually has impacted or influenced our portfolio as such. And let me start there. You see actually between access to drugs for patients, the clinical studies with the exception of some delays in early clinical trials, balance sheets, the investment universe expansion, the drug launches, everything actually was doable and actually worked quite well. With one exception, I think that has impacted the overall uh, situation that was M&A, because uh, people could not travel and management teams and boards could not meet. Um, so we can say that's even a positive on a forward basis, because I said uh, there is a backlog of potential M&A activity for the second half 2020, or in 2021, hopefully when I said the situation has normalized on a global uh, level. And then last but not least, on the external factors that we think on a forward basis have some influence, both positive and negative, or it could be a risk and upside. Let me start with regulatory authorities. We had a change or in leadership at FDA. So Stephen Hahn is the new commissioner. He was quite busy as well uh, in the COVID-19 crisis in the US, but I hope I could convince you that I said the regulatory authorities are quite active, both in terms of our portfolio with many approvals, as well as on an industry level. The second bullet there, the equity investor. I think that's a positive as well to report because after many years of rather negative fund flows, we have seen now many weeks and now the second month of actually positive fund flows. So a clear indication that a lot of investors are underweight or not exposed to the biotech industry. I think that will hold up. <clears throat> and then last but not least, the politics um, that will make a comeback on that level again. So the US presidential election. Racer campaign will kickstart again. Uh, the race will be between Trump and Biden. So I would say for healthcare investors, it was important that Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren dropped out of the race because they had rather radical views and pushed uh, the single payer system or actually the government run healthcare system in the US. We think that's clearly off the table and the healthcare reform look much more modest. And we think as well that the drug pricing um, discussion could be impacted, as I said, because of the currency that the industry has gained by investing so much into the COVID-19 solution. Then on an economical level, what we watch out for is how will the US unemployment 
rates continue to evolve because if that's going to be a sustained problem that has an impact because more people will roll over from private healthcare insurance to the public side and the same is true for how strained the, U, uh, the European uh, government budgets will be uh, because as I said many of the European countries have a government run healthcare system so we watch out how that's going to evolve. And to close it out, I think some positive messages, um, as I said, from our side, the portfolio we think is very attractively valued. We think BB Biotech offers an easy access to a highly selected uh, portfolio that is then access to leading technologies and innovative drugs. And that translates into a high growth um, portfolio and situation for our shareholders as well. We think, as I said, the COVID-19 crisis, we see it rather as an opportunity, not from a drug stance in terms of making capital returns out of COVID-19 solutions, but more, much more because it has a positive influence on the public opinion, as I said, for drug price discussion. And then from a board and team level, I think we could show that uh, we have managed the crisis quite well. We stuck to our fundamentals and will continue to do so and have a very established investment process. So we saw that we added new position, will continue so throughout the remaining of the year or the remainder of the year. And we are all convinced of actually the value and the upside potential that's uh, within the portfolio as such. And last but not least, more structural um, um, speciality from BB Biotech, given that we invest into growth. Um, and want to be unconstrained into what we invest. We have clearly a portfolio that would not pay a dividend, and that's why we construct the dividend. And you see here as well um, that the chairman at uh, the latest AGM clearly outlined that this policy will continue. And this has been a driver uh, that BB Biotech got as well selected into the SPS Select uh, Dividend Top 20 Index in Switzerland which we think is another support and for our policy as such. With that, I thank you for your attention and for the time spending on this presentation and um, hope that this was, as I said, a fruitful uh, presentation for you. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe we've been able to give you a very interesting insight into BB Biotech's portfolio and future drug developments. However, from our point of view, it's important that biotech investments in digital securities are highly uh, risky and should only be made in, in rare and then single cases. BB Biotech, on the other hand, offers a balanced portfolio that is geared towards future drugs developments. If you have any questions on this topic or on BB Biotech, please contact your relationship manager or send us an email at info at Bellevue dot ch from our side thank you very much for your patient for your attendance to this call uh, stay healthy and we wish you a very good week <laughs>